Good evening. How are we all? So this evening we're going to be starting the carving on the uh, key, the hair key block for Jed's new design. Um, it's fairly straightforward. Just loads of uh, loads of scruffy little hairs to carve. I'll just sit here quietly until it till the chat fills up a little bit more. Hi John, how are you? Thank you very much. We're learning. Yeah, it is animal hair. It's um, it is. It's from a an anime. It's a flying bison. So the 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 figures that you would have seen me carving on the previous streams is um, <clears throat> excuse me, they're sat atop this this animal, and there's two hair blocks for this there's there's this one which is the main bulk of his hair and then the reverse side of this block which is some sort of scruffy edges and a, and a bit of the the key for the the clouds and stuff that they're that they're riding through My uh, my apologies for uh, missing the previous stream. Um, I was sending the all the Patreon prints out, and it turns out now in the UK it is extremely difficult to send anything abroad. Um, difficult just in terms of the amount of paperwork. So originally I'd wanted to send all of the Patreon prints out via UPS because it's quicker for one and it means that I haven't got to go into the local post office for obvious reasons. The local post office is, is um, within a supermarket and I didn't much like the idea of going and standing in there for... 40 minutes filling out customs forms but now you have to so usually with UPS you fill out three customs forms um, for for each person that's going to handle your parcel but you didn't have to do that previously with um, envelopes or packages you would just fill out a small a small uh, a small form and that would that would suffice but now we have to fill out the three forms for any single thing that goes out of the country, no matter where it's going. Um, so with, <clears throat> I think, nearly 20, I think 20 um, prints that go out each time, and having to fill out three forms for each, And only then do you get to the point where you find out how much that's going to cost you. And now it costs more. It was just completely... It was just a complete nightmare. So, 
I ended up having to do what I didn't want to do and go and stand in the post office and send them off. Yeah, it worked out for the best then, Ryan. Yeah, I was uh, sat here tearing my hair out over how I was going to sort this out. So I send all my, everything that I send to, to Jed goes through UPS as well, and it's just created so many... Um, so many more hurdles, and, and now Jed has to pay uh, customs on everything coming in, and when he previously didn't have to, there's even more work to fill out online, and it's just a mess. Yeah, it, it, previously it was it was reasonably simple. We would just package it up, give it a value, and then that determines my my shipping cost. And we never had an issue. Um, sometimes with stuff coming into the UK previously before before the UK um, left the European Union, you would sometimes say from places like Japan or especially. Uh, pricey things from the US you would get uh, a customs charge but now um, Jed also receives a customs charge I, I, I would assume that that is part of the <coughs> excuse me part of the whole process but yeah so it sort of means Jed either incurs very large uh, fees or we undervalue what it is that we're sending to try and mitigate the customs charges so much but then if anything is to go wrong you're not insured for the v for the full value of what it is that you're sent hi ben how are you Ben, you're medieval space race, aren't you? On um, on Instagram, if I'm correct. I'm terrible with with uh, remembering people's actual names from from Instagram. I only ever remember their handles, so I apologise. Yeah, same. Yeah, I was looking at your um I was looking at your Etsy page the other day and there's a there's a couple of prints on there that I think I'm gonna have to purchase if they're still if they still are available when I when I actually come to it. I've got them on my watch list. For anyone that hasn't seen uh, Ben's prints and would like to, then you can see him at Instagram. Uh, if Ben, you, if you want to plug yourself, you can. I, I'm gonna 
throw a plug out anyway because I think your prints are. I think your prints are wicked, but um. Ben has a an Etsy page where he sells his uh his prints. And you should all give him a follow and and have a look at his work. It's great. Oh great! I'll, I'm gonna I'm gonna have a look. Yeah, there's a couple that I had my own. I I I love anything to do with uh, with space and especially the uh, the Apollo missions. I used to watch. I used to watch. Uh, what was it? NASA's greatest achievements, like back to back. I used to just watch it over and over and over. I think it was uh, made in sort of mid 2000s on the Discovery Channel. But I used to love that. And I love the I love the twist you have on your your illustration style. It's really cool. Combining the old like European. Um, woodblock type illustration What part of uh, Asia did you used to live in, John, if I, if you don't mind me asking? Oh no, it's really cool. There's a, it's a really um. Ben, it's a really unique take on that style of um, printmaking. I hope I hope you're doing well. I hope you're selling loads. I hope it's keeping you busy. So there's something interesting here. So you can see very faintly, I've got the the figures from the original key block printed out here. And I've done that as a sort of reference. So so the, the way I've carved the key block, it's never gonna be exact, but I've just kept it there as a, as a sort of reference so that I know sort of how far the uh, the hairs are pulling more more around the the face of the bison here because you've got the eyes but then you've got these two little sections of hair in here and then there's a couple of bits around the nose just so that I know how far to to sort of fade the ends of the hair off oh, sorry yeah how far to fade the ends of the hair off sort of around here and then around the eyes 
It just sort of gives me a reference then. Oh wow, John! I bet that's. I bet that was. I bet that was really interesting living there. I've. Uh, I've never been fortunate enough to to visit. I've always wanted to. Um, to travel to Southeast Asia, especially China. I'm really interested in um, Chinese history and how it sort of. Uh, spread out across the world and stuff. That's how everything starts, though, Ben. This this started out as a hobby, and the more you do it, the more you put out there. We're so fortunate with um, Instagram and stuff, being able to share things so readily and and sort of have the potential to reach wide audiences very fast that you can there's sort of no limit as to what you can what you can do with your your work now so I hope if you if you want it to you might not want it to but if you if you do I hope it does turn into a a career path for you But as long as it pays for yourself and keeps, uh, as long as it pays for itself and keeps paying for you to get the materials, then that's that's perfect, isn't it? That was sort of my first goal. <coughs> Excuse me. That was my first goal with this was to get it to a point where it just pays for itself. And then the next step is, uh, can I pay for my? My lease on my van. Can I pay my phone bill? And it just sort of snowballs from there. Hey Kai. Um, so, yes, yeah, sort of. Not not in anything like this. So, I came out of school and went to college. So college, not as in university as you as as it's called in the US. Um, so we have college, and then you can do university and things past that um and i wanted to be i really wanted to be an illustrator i had sort of this idea that i was going to be an illustrator of comic books and manga and things like that and realized very quickly that i have no sort of aptitude for that whatsoever and what i thought was was uh, good of my own work was in fact quite terrible and sort of discovered graphic design and then went to university to, to do a graphic design degree. And through there, uh, through a, a really cool teacher I had there, um, spent more and more time in the, in the printmaking room, uh, screen printing and doing cool stuff with uh, old risograph printers and things like that. And, that was interested me a lot more, sort of the analog side of producing images as opposed to uh, like digital design and things like that. 
and yeah, so I sort of found uh, Japanese woodblock prints through going to a, a a local museum, and they were just on sort of on display. I thought, wow, these are like these are pretty cool, and uh, sort of just started messing around and had a go. Found Dave's website. Uh, and YouTube channel and just sort of consumed absolutely everything of of Dave's and sort of learnt what I could and then was very fortunate to meet uh, Jed Henry who is Dave's sort of partner and I now collaborate pretty much exclusively with, with Jed but yeah, so there's somewhat of a more of a, a background in in design, I would say. And uh, I worked as a carpenter for years and years with my with my dad part time and then full time, and sort of used that to supplement um, making prints. Yeah, so I built it up to the point where I felt like I could try and make a go of it as a job. And I've been doing this full time sort of since I think July twenty nineteen. My hands, I hope my hands aren't getting in the way too much of the carving. <laughs> yeah, I can remember seeing Dave's, <clears throat> I think the first, um, the first video I saw of Dave's channel was I think he was carving Samus's hair on the, I think it's called Infestation, on the Infestation print. And I just thought, wow. And it was really sort of like approachable. Because um, there's... I thought that it's sort of this mystical Japanese thing and I'd never be able to do it. There's no one else going to be doing it. And then there was Dave, this Western guy who was living in Japan and was really successful, obviously really, really good at it. And it was, yeah, it was like really cool to see that there was someone that could do this and I just he was just starting out on the great wave print I think that's where the sort of video series had got up to 
and I just watched like every single every single video like hundreds and hundreds of times just watched them over and over and over and just studied everything about what he was doing and what he was saying and tried very unsuccessfully to apply that to what I was doing cool thank you And if he still has it up on his um, on his other site, not the Mukahankan site, the the woodblock.com site, um, he did a a story series, like a diary almost, like a blog, um, called One Story a Week. And that's fascinating because it's sort of Dave's life as a printmaker. And uh, not everything's about printmaking, but it's sort of this really cool mindset, uh, sort of cool insight into his mindset and what he was, what he was doing and stuff. And I just, I just read absolutely everything that he he had written and just watched it. So that would be my my piece of advice if anyone was to say to me, "How do I get into this?" Just go and watch Dave. Carving stuff like this really is some of my um, weakness. Um, if I was, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm thirty years old now, and I'm, I'm settled. I've, I've got a partner, and and I've got a girlfriend and stuff that I've been with for years and years. And I'm, I'm settled here, and I have a, I have a life here, so it's, it's never really an option. If I was. If I was like a single twenty-year-old guy, then it it would definitely be something that I would would maybe have pursued purely because there's just more more chances to learn. I'm not going to say that I would get better or I'd be. I certainly wouldn't uh, be making the type of money that I am now. Purely because I would have been in a in a apprenticeship, and I wouldn't have been seen as I wouldn't be anywhere near good enough to to produce work that um, would allow me to sort of complete my apprenticeship at this point. Um, but just in terms of opportunity to learn, then yes, most definitely being in Japan, it would be would be preferable in that sense but that doesn't mean that I am sort of any worse of a printmaker or any less likely to be successful um, and I have a I have a very fulfilling life here that I enjoy very much but um, but yeah in terms of opportunity to learn then there's you sort of you go to source, don't you? It's like the all the Japanese um, artists in the post-war period all going going to France to um, 
learn uh, watercolour painting. They all became very good French watercolour painters and came back and then influenced the next wave of printmakers who started the Shinhanga movement and produced these really highly detailed, very atmospheric prints. That's a good question. Thank you for that. Um, wet sanding. So wet sanding is a bit, a little bit of both, really. So when you when you first get when you've got the um, the block, the raw wood, obviously you're gonna have the uh, when you have it finished for you, it's not gonna be it's not gonna be smooth. It'd be it'd be fairly smooth, but it's not going to be um, any good to really print or carve on. So what we do is we do the first so it's sort of run down run out to size a rough size using something called a, a planer thicknesser and it's like sort of a tabletop plane that um, strips away some of the wood and then we do some finishing with planes sort of getting it down to a certain level and then i do the final wet sanding and that is to make sure that i have a surface that's smooth as possible so that when I put the pigment on because any any sort of loose or ragged grain would um, soak up water and pigment in different ways and you would run the risk of having sort of uh, blotchy or sort of ragged looking uh, printed colours Uh, and, and then obviously you want a good a good clean block for, for carving on but we're actually um, slowly figuring out the figuring out how to use planes to do it now and it gives a much much better finish um, and also saves a lot of time wet sanding is rather time consuming I mean to do a block set of eight to run through all of the um, all of the grades of sandpaper takes me a takes me a good couple of days in what a, a plane could do in a few hours. Um, I'm not one hundred percent sure. Ben, so I've been using my color blocks are all um, North American cherry, and my my suggestion would be to just test them. Um, take a test print or a few test prints, and just see how they print. I've never personally done done anything with them with dry sanding. I've only ever wet sanded and I just do that because that's what I'd heard was the alternative. And also in my mind it would keep the blocks smoother and less chance <coughs> less chance of uh, dust, uh, dust building up. But if it prints, if it prints well, dry sanded, then then um, 
by all means go for it um you can tell with wet sanding i will say with wet sanding you can tell when you get down to the really high grit papers like a, a 3000 or a 5000 you can feel when you've got that glassy uh i haven't been uh john so we worked through basically i worked through so we we used a scraper plane to get as good a finish as possible a french scraper plane and then i work from about 400 grit up to about 5000 um using a a hard block a hard piece of wood uh to keep it flat on the surface and that served served well up and up until this point but i think from now on we're going to be doing it with with planes with japanese planes i did a couple of tests on some some off cuts of cherry and it came up it came up really really good Yeah, that could be the case. It's just at, at the point of, of anything above sort of a thousand, I would say you're more just polishing the wood. You're not going to be actually sanding anything. It's more it's more of a burnishing um, effect there, Kai. You're just you're just polishing the wood at that point and, and just giving it the smoothest sort of surface possible. So when you when you look at at this you can see sort of the shine in the wood and these are these are wet sanded blocks from from japan this blocks from japan but you can see the shine here not this bit because it's got glue but in here you can see that shine and that's sort of what you're looking for that sort of burnished quality to the wood and that's sort of that's the purpose of using a really high grit um, sandpaper there. So we've got a few minutes. We've got 15 minutes or so left. Um, when we've got about five minutes to go, I've got a, a little picture to show you. Um, it's the... I think it's... What I've decided is going to be the third design in the Patreon series of birds. Um... But I'll show you guys. I've got an image saved and I'll, and I'll pop it up on the screen. Yeah, uh, yeah, John, I, I would agree. Um, any any sort of plane or scraping with a card scraper is, is always going to give a better finish. Um, it was sort of just more out of we just didn't really know how to do it um, but we sort of took the plunge we've got a um, we've got a Japanese a good Japanese plane we've got our French scraper plane and we're trying to get hold of a Japanese scraper plane and that's we're just gonna we're just gonna work it out and learn how to do it the the couple of little tests I did came out quite nicely and that was just with the um, the standard Japan uh, standard Japanese plane not with a a more tilted edge or anything like that and that worked really well. Just uh, from a point of view of a Western person, it's always used Western tools, working as a carpenter and stuff. It's it feels really odd to use a Japanese plane. As you know, all, all Western planes, it's uh, it's pushing. They're all pushing tools, and Japanese plane is a is a pulling tool, and it's sort of it's really odd. Sort of flicking your mind to sort of think a different way when you're doing it. It's different 
different hand positions and everything. my blade. When you chip your blade you gotta make sure you uh, get the section out of the wood. You don't want to hit that again. So let's sharpen the blade up. Let's fix the edge of the blade so I can show you that and then um, I'll show off this new new Patreon design. That's left there. That's one of my stones on the Bed and so this blade's just about done anyway. Um, Otherwise, it'd be rather frustrating because uh, a break like this is uh, quite a long winded fix. So it's a case of just sharpening the blade and just taking off, just sharpen it as you normally would on a lower grit stone. This is a 400 diamond stone. And just keep taking off blade until you <laughs> get rid of this this break. And you can see it. You can see the um, Well, anyway, you'll see and you'll feel the burr in the back. And it's just a case of just keep sharpening through it. And just making sure you keep the pressure consistent and you don't rock. Or sort of scoop your hand up at the end of the end of the stone. We're almost there. And to be careful not to put pressure, to get the pressure equal on the centre of the blade, not to press too heavy on this side or or the front side of the blade. To uh, otherwise you'll be changing the angle. So 
don't know how well you can see now. Can you see? Come up. Can you see that sort of shining edge on the bottom here? That's the, the burr that's building up as we take more of the blade away. And I don't know if this is a proper technique, but how I sharpen, so I've got pressure down with my, my index finger there, and then my ring finger, I'm pushing up into the palm of my hand. So I've got pressure in two places to stop the stop the blade from, from sliding, and then I just lock at the elbow. There we go. So that's the grinding stage done. Uh, no, you don't strop. I don't strop the blades. I um. So I have the that that stone there. That diamond stone is is just for for chips and and things like that. Then I have this stone, which is an eight hundred. Uh, this one, which is a finishing stone, which is maybe, I don't know, 3,000 maybe. And then I have, or I did have, it's broken half now. That is for the back side of the blade. So as I talk, I'll talk through the, the process as I go. And then I use, this is uh, Nagora or Nagora. So this creates like a slurry on the surface of the stone so now I'm going to do the back side of the blade I've got to take this this burr off and you see it's just that whole burr there is popped off in my finger so now we will have loads of little burrs left so it's a, just clean up the back edge a little bit But because that was quite a rough stone, I like to go with the uh, the 700 on the, on here, or the 800, whatever it is, and just sort of touch this edge up here, just very lightly, just putting a sort of finish on the front edge of that. So you don't really do stropping. On, uh, on blades like this. So as the knife sort of gets dull, I'll, I might, if it's getting rather dull and I've been sort of particularly lazy in, in keeping it sharp, I might touch it up on this stone quickly and then finish it up on that. Otherwise I just finish it up on there a little bit. There's not really a lot of stropping that goes, that goes on. You can, um, it's just not something that I've necessarily heard too much of in, in Japanese printmaking. And one important thing, you can see this the tip of this blade now is very fine. And that will straight away will, will snap as soon as we put it back in the wood. So we take the back edge of the blade, back edge of the, of the point, and we're actually going to put a bevel on that tip of the blade on the side of this stone here. And sort of bring it back on itself. And that is to try and mitigate some of the breakage. So let's see if I can see if it will zoom in this time. It's not going to. <laughs> so now we've done that, we can finish the back edge. 
and then we're going to put another small bevel on this very very tip of the blade here so we're going to hold it up a few degrees and just drag that sh that sharpened edge of the blade along the back of this stone and just put a very small bevel on that back side and now comes time for the finishing stone And it's exactly the same motion as before you just don't need as much pressure we're just taking those final few burrs off and just polishing the blade so you can see the nice shine on it now and you have to do both sides and keep doing it until you can you can't feel uh, the burrs on the on the on the blade edge because I've, I've ground the blade quite a lot with that diamond stone it can take a few passes on this stone to to really clean up all the little burrs and stuff so there we go nicely fixed blade Zoom in now. Is it only going to focus on one bit? Maybe if I bring the block back up. Okay. So don't know how well you can see but there's a, a very slight bevel been put just on that very tip of the blade and then you can just see just behind the tip the bevel that we put on this back edge there but last couple of minutes so I'm going to pull up the image for the next Patreon print so here we go hopefully that's big enough for everyone if you want me to zoom in on it do let me know and I'll, I'll just enlarge the, the image and stuff um, it is if I'm correct if I can remember correctly I found this image weeks and weeks ago um, it's a design by Hiroshige um, and sort of the, the <coughs> excuse me the point of the series up until this point has been sort of picking an artist or a design from different eras of uh, Japanese woodblock printmaking from, from the start where they were just fairly crude not crude but fairly simplistic um, single colour designs uh, and then we moved through into sort of the the advent of colour printing uh, multi multi block printing with the the eagle print from last time and now we're moving into sort of more complex sort of the the golden age of ukiyo-e where you had these nice subtle gradations and there was a lot more balance and sort of taste in the, in the colours and they weren't so much just like block filled in areas um, and then we'll be progressing with the final print will be something a lot more along the lines of a, a Shinhanga type design a more contemporary type image that's, that's uh, a lot more complex in terms of its uh, the the makeup of the blocks and the the color the coloring and things like that, but 
this is I think this is the designer effect I'm 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 95 percent sure um, I need to as much as I can translate the text to know sort of what to keep and what not to keep um, because there's no need to keep sort of titles of people and and things like that and the the seal uh i'm not sure i need to i need to look at some better examples in in this of, of this this was just a, a quick grab a quick screen grab that i got um if there were to be any embossings i would anticipate it to be within the leaves of the flowers um perhaps some nice subtle little lines i haven't played a great deal i've done a few embossings and, and things like that and I, I understand the process um there was a a really nice crane design that i wanted to do and then i realized that dave had done it and it's that nice crane with the really nicely embossed feathers and things um so i sort of shot that one down rather quick but yeah i need to do a bit of more research into the print find find a few different versions of the of the design to um, to sort of compare and contrast and, and find the sort of the the best the best uh, versions of the print that I can sort of pull apart and, and make use of um, but yeah and, th and then there'll be a, a border in and around uh, the sizing will be the same size as all the as uh, all the other prints which is which is which is uh, I can't remember two seconds let me just grab one of them So this is the eagle design for anyone else that hasn't seen it yet. And the size is, the size will be 13.5 by 17.5 centimeters. Um, it's a nice manageable size, fits within the price range. So you can see the, the differences with this, this print. This is fairly flat colors, fairly, um, simplistic in its makeup i changed it was uh, a really terrible sort of red ochre color um it really wasn't very nice um in the in the tree in the eagle's body and i, I sort of changed that up in favor of this nice sort of monochrome a uh, sort of um natural tone design and this is this is how you will receive your your print a little bit of information on the artist and the, and the print itself. Um, but yeah, the yeah, so I'm pretty sure that's going to be the next design. I'm going to start the tracing and stuff later on this week. And uh, yeah, it shouldn't it shouldn't take too long to trace. It's not the eagle one was quite long. Was uh, quite long winded because you had all the little little small bits and the the print that i worked from was a little bit scruffy in its in its printing a lot of the lines were sort of blown out and stuff so it took quite a while thank you very much ryan um but yeah so that's going to be it for today i'll be back friday same time um to get notified patreons will get notified as as they always do um but you can either keep up to date if you if you don't already do so um 
you can keep up to date by following me on Instagram at Francis Hanger or at YouTube on the, the same under the same name. Uh, if you're if you click notifications, you'll get notified when I do go live or when videos do go up. The streams are now being archived, so if you missed anything or you want to go back and watch old streams, you can you can do so. Um, other than that, thank you very much, everyone, and I shall see you Friday. Everyone stay safe out there, stay healthy, and I will see you all again. Thank you.